We are live. Hello, fellow listeners. Welcome to another edition of Socialist Action Webcast. My name is Elizabeth Weiss. I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Wendat and Audenoshawnee people in a place called Toronto. Today, I'm speaking to you from Jamaica, where the Indigenous Taino and Arawak-speaking people began arriving here 4,000 years ago, but were wiped out by European colonial powers. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporation and returning them to the commons. Tonight's topic is the sport and prey of capitalists, how the rich are stealing Canada's public wealth, published 2019, featuring its author, Linda McQuaid, with discussants John Ord in Thornhill and Emily Stairs in Guelph. Linda will speak for about 25 minutes and John and Emily will speak for about seven each. Then we will take questions from our online audience and they can submit a question by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube and by typing the question into the chat column. You can direct your question to a specific person or to everyone and in turn, uh, all panelists can answer all questions. Also, folks, if you agree with what you hear during this program, please join Socialist Action by calling us up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, and by calling 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. Now, let's begin. Let's welcome our first speaker. Linda Joy McQuaig is a Canadian journalist, columnist, nonfiction author, and social critic. She is known for a series of best-selling books that challenge the dominant free market economic ideology. She argues for a more equal distribution of power, income, and wealth. The National Post described McQuay as Canada's Michael Moore. Of course, on the other hand, Conrad Black, who once owned the National Post, had less complimentary things to say about Linda. Linda was the NDP candidate in the Toronto Centre federal by-election in 2013 and the 2015 general election. So welcome, Linda. Unmute yourself. Sorry, Linda, you are muted. How's that? That's good, Linda. But anyway, thank you for that kind introduction. And I was just going to add that when the National Post described me as Canada's Michael Moore, they did not mean that as a compliment. <laughs> they think Michael Moore is a total idiot. And so mm -hmm. they were putting me in that category. Uh, but, you know, I'm certainly flattered. Um, and now, Elizabeth, you mentioned I ran for politics twice. I, I ran for the NDP in Toronto Centre. Um, in fact, I end up running against two people who end up becoming finance ministers. You know, uh -huh. First against Christian Freeland and then against Bill Morneau. And it was funny, when I was running against Christian, uh, people used to say, oh, you're, you two are so alike. You... you uh, you know, you both wrote books about the the rich. Uh, and, you know, I would always think, well, it is true. We both wrote books about the rich, but the books were very different. Like Freeland's book was basically, you know, the rich are running the world and they're doing a great job. Whereas my book was more in the spirit of the, of the protesters who marched down Wall Street right, right after the 2008 crash, carrying a placard that read, jump, you fuckers. Anyway, <laughs> so I just want to say that um, I guess that's why Christian Freeland is finance minister, and I'm not. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here today and, and to give an opportunity to talk about my books. 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the sport and prey of capitalists, um, which uh, I should point out is kind of, <coughs> sorry, um, is, is kind of the story of the history of public enterprise in Canada. Um, uh, you know, we hear so much about, you know, the history of private enterprise, but we don't hear about the history of public enterprise. And Canada actually is a, is a country with really quite an impressive history of public enterprise. I mean, the United States, for instance, you could say was a country that focuses more on private enterprise and maybe has excelled at private enterprise, although not a very good kind of private enterprise. But Canada has a different tradition. Uh, you know, Canada, uh, you know, from the creation of public power plants to a, a national public railway to a national public broadcasting system, a public pharmaceutical company, a public pu pu a number of public banks. It, Canada did something very distinctive. Uh, and I, I would argue there was something in our culture even that made us inclined towards this uh, more public approach to things. Um, for instance, in the, I mentioned public power, Canada is really distinctive in that we, uh, we developed public power at a very early age. There was no public power uh, in the United States at that point. And then it, we started in the 1890s pushing for, a, public, for pu a publicly owned power system to get control of the water power of Niagara Falls. Uh, and not only, the, it's incredible the extent to which the, the, there, there became a public movement in favor of public power uh, in Canada. There were thousands of people in Ontario pushing for public power. And so when, we actually, when they actually won uh, against the very powerful entrenched interests of what were known back then as the water barons, it was an incredible victory. And, and the result, of course, was Ontario Hydro, and that went on to, in fact, uh, be a terribly important for the development of the province. Uh, it also was an inspiration to FDR during the Depression when he uh, wanted to develop public power systems in the US. And in fact, he had always been impressed by Ontario Hydro and he modeled uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, for instance, after Ontario Hydro. So that, that's kind of, the, the, the point is that Canada does really have this interesting tradition. Really nowhere else in the world, for instance, was there a popular movement for public power. That was something distinctive to, what was distinctive to Ontario. Uh, anyway, the, the, the tragedy is that despite this interesting history and this impressive history we have in public power, in recent decades, in the last three or four decades, we've of course gone over to accepting the privatization agenda as part of the big neoliberal agenda. Um, and, and, you know, we've uh, gotten so that, you know, we treat privatization as some kind of dogma. We don't even, it's not even challenged. I mean, business and governments are always uh, just assuming that the private sector does things better uh, and asserting that, uh, you know, the private sector always does things better, the private sector is more efficient. They, these things are always asserted, never with any proof, because in fact, there isn't any proof that they do anything better, do, do things better necessarily. Um, in fact, if you look at the evidence, which is what I, I tried to do in the sport and craft capitalists, what you find is that uh, the private sector certainly does not always do things better. They always do things more expensively and that benefits the private owners, but for the public, uh, that's just additional costs and the results 
are almost always worse. And the reason they're almost always worse when you think about it, it's not hard to imagine, is that the, the private sector as opposed to the public sector, the private sector is, is its entire focus really is on profit making. That's what corporations are mandated to do. I'm not even saying that in a critical way. That's just what their mandate is. So sure, they want to serve customers well, but their, their ultimate concern is profit making. So when so much effort and focus is on profit making, it's not surprising uh, that you don't end up with a, as good a result as a public sphere where that profit imperative just doesn't exist. And the imperative to serve the public interest does exist. Whether or not it's always lived up to is a different point, uh, but it, it does exist. Um, yeah, and it's interesting that, uh, you know, the public, the public actually doesn't like privatization, even though it's become this dogma and we just accept that it's so extremely, so, so comprehensively. And I think that's why we hear the expression public-private partnerships, P3s, because I think the government has realized that, uh, you know, the public doesn't really like the idea of, of the private sector taking over, uh, you know, so many of its public services. Um, and if you throw words like uh, public and partnership, it kind of softens the whole thing. I, I want to, you know, maybe we can look at this most clearly, I think, uh, with the example of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Um, now, the Canada Infrastructure Bank is a fairly new creation of, of the Trudeau government. Uh, in fact, the background was that during the 2015 election, when Trudeau was worst, first running for prime minister, um, you know, he, he talked about it a lot and he, he must, I must say, he made it sound really good. And, and Morneau, who was, of course, already being considered for finance minister, would talk about it a lot. And, you know, I was running against Morneau in that election uh, in Toronto Centre. And I can remember in the debates all the time, he would bring up uh, this Canada Infrastructure Bank and he would talk about it as they wanted to help municipalities build infrastructure, which of course they need, um, and, and help them by allowing them to get access to really low interest rates. And I must say, it sounded good. It sounded really good. In fact, uh, it sounded kind of like the, the public banks that exist in Europe. Uh, but after the election, something very different happened. Uh, after the election, uh, Trudeau went over to Davos and he met up with Larry Fink, who's the top guy at BlackRock, a, a very powerful Wall Street guy. Um, and, and BlackRock control something like five trillion in investment assets. And what, what basically happened, uh, I don't know exactly what went on in that converse, in those conversations with Larry Fink and Trudeau, but what is clear came out of them is a total change in what this bank was to be all about. Uh, it was no longer about helping municipalities, you know, build infrastructure at low cost. It was now going to be really about helping investors, uh, about making sure that investors were brought into these deals and would uh, uh, benefit from them. And then, you know, that's pretty extraordinary when you think about it. It was really no longer a public bank in any meaningful sense, even though it was funded with $35 billion of public money. Um, let, let me just explain I think in uh, an example, I can explain just how bad it was or how bad it is, I should say. Um, it, it, that, uh, there's a little a township in Ontario called Mapleton. I think it's owned by Guelph, actually. Um, and it needed uh, its water and water systems, uh, needs some infrastructure development. So the CIB, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, actually approached it 
and offered them one of one of their P3 deals. Uh, and they offered them, it, it was a very generous package, like the infrastructure was going to cost between 15 and 30 million. And they offered, the infrastructure bank offered a $20 million debt financing package, like a real subsidy. But here's the point. The subsidy went straight to the developer, to the private partner, not to the municipality. So, so what ended up happening was that the town township did some research and they found out that the P3 deal was going to be really expensive. It's going to be way more expensive than if the town financed the, the infrastructure itself, the way municipalities have traditionally done it. They've traditionally, you know, sold municipal bonds, that kind of thing. Um, and that's traditionally worked, worked well. Um, but they found that with, despite this bank that was supposedly set up to help them of, you know, pay for infrastructure, it was going to be more expensive to use the bank than, than to not use it. Um, so, so what, and, and by the way, let me just quickly insert that uh, the town was, township was right about this. Uh, the Auditor General in Ontario, in fact, has looked at uh, public-private partnerships. And in one situation, she looked at, studied 74 of them and concluded that those 74 P3 projects, if the government had done them itself as opposed to using a P3 financing structure, uh, the, the public would have saved about $8 billion. So the, the town of Ma township of Mapleton is right, it's much more expensive to do it this way. So, so they actually, Mapleton turned the deal down. They said, we don't want to go this route um and and so, so they decided they would do it on their own they would walk away from this this apparently lucrative offer so now you would think that the, what the what the bank should have done was say okay you don't want this private sector deal how about we give you the 20 million fi financing package you the municipality but no, no, nothing like that. Um, the, the Canada Infrastructure Bank offers nothing to townships, to municipalities that want to go it on their own. It, you know, no private partner, no deal. So what that really tells you is that all what this whole bank is about, it's nothing to do with helping municipalities. It's helping the private sector profit from, you know, infrastructure, from, from our vital water services, that kind of thing. And yet, this is public money. We're talking about $35 billion. That $35 billion isn't going to benefit the township of Mapleton. It walked away from the deal because it was so bad. And it was offered nothing on its own. Instead, it was only offered to the, to the private partners. So anyway, I would argue the mandate of the of this uh, infrastructure bank must urgently be changed. This is just it, unconscionable the way it's set up. Um, and in fact, you know, there there's a, a a bank in Holland that a public bank that does nothing but finance water projects, and they what they do is they loan to municipalities at extremely low interest rates and they enable municipalities to build their projects. This is exactly what a public bank should be doing. Anyway, Trudeau, of course, uh, is very unlikely to change the mandate of this, but I think this would be a terrific issue for the NDP uh, because, you know, this is, this is a scam of enormous proportions. We're talking about $35 billion that's essentially headed towards the, the, the private sector for no advantage to the public. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the problems of privatization uh, as they highlighted in the pandemic. Uh, 
because of course in the pandemic, the need for public services is even stronger than usual. Um, and, and one vivid case I think is uh, long-term care homes. Um, we've, we've all seen what a fiasco that has become the long-term care homes, but I wanna look at it as a story of privatization because uh, you know Mike Harris back in the 1990s brought privatization to long-term care. Back then they called them nursing homes. And, and they had nursing homes back then, but they were mostly small operations, either publicly or privately run or run by charities. But, but there was a potential for this to become a really lucrative industry uh, because it's, it's government funded. Uh, and also, uh, you know, because there was an explosion of baby boom aging. Um, and so what Harris did uh, was he encouraged the big players to come in. He partly encouraged it by removing the minimum staff requirements at nursing homes, which when you think about it is just atrocious. I mean, the number of staff available to help people would seem crucial. Why would you eliminate that requirement, but it was clearly to make it more attractive to the private sector. Uh, and he certainly, uh, he certainly did make it more attractive. In fact, the, the long-term care industry, LTC industry was soon dominated by big corporate chains. And then of course, the, when the pandemic came along, uh, the, these long-term care homes became real death traps. Um, you know, we've had 3,700 residents die in long-term care homes in Ontario. Um, and, and, you know, what, what's uh, Ford's response? His response has been uh, legislation to protect the private owners from lawsuits. Uh, and there have been a lot of lawsuits because uh, the death rates, this is very significant, the death rates have been 70% higher in profit-making homes than in non-profit homes or public homes, you know, non-profit-making homes. 78% higher the death rate of, from COVID in these homes. Uh, and higher still, higher still, even beyond just the private-making, are what's called uh, homes that are operated by financialized firms. These are like private equity uh, known for sort of high finance moves, squeezing every penny out of an operation. Fin financialized firms have been described as profit-making on steroids. So here we have profit-making on steroids allowed in homes, caring for the most vulnerable. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Um, I mean, this is unbelievable that this wasn't spotted as a problem, but of course, Mike Harris spotted it as a business opportunity. And as we know, he stepped down as premier in 2002 and the following year became chairman uh, of a financialized firm that operated long-term care homes, Chartwell, uh, which, so there's profit making on steroids in the firm the premier was, became chairman of. Um, the Charwell is now one of the biggest Ontario chains operating long-term care homes. And over the past decade, it's paid out $800 million to shareholders, $50 million to executives, plus $237,000 a year to Harris for his part-time job as, as uh, chairman, which he still holds. And that, of course, you can imagine this is a government funded industry. So you can imagine they're moving things around so that a lot of that money is coming from government. Uh, and I think we have to ask the question, you know, of the 3,700 COVID deaths, uh, how, many, how many of those are due to the fact that they're, they were for-profit homes, which we know have a much higher rate of death. Can we say a thousand of them can be attributed to that or 800? 1200, I don't know, but it's an incredible indictment uh, and an incredible commentary uh, on the perils of privatization. 
Um, and while we're at it, another example of the very foolish privatization highlighted by the pandemic is that, you know, right here in Toronto, we, we used to have one of the leading vaccine makers in the world. And it was owned by the people of Canada. It, it's an incredible story. I mean, it goes back, the, the, I tell this story, of course, in my book, that um, it goes back to 1913. There was a terrible uh, diphtheria epidemic in Canada. Canadian children were dying at a terrible rate. Um, and what made it particularly tragic was that there was a treatment available and it was relatively effective. But it was expensive and, you know, only the rich could afford it. Uh, so a Toronto doctor, uh, Dr. John Fitzgerald, uh, was outraged by this and he set out to change it. And he did some experiments on his own on horses in a barn. And he ended up developing an antitoxin that could treat diphtheria that was based on the knowledge of, at the time. And then with the help of the University of Toronto, he created something called Connaught Labs that produced this diphtheria treatment and distributed it. And it was so effective, they went on and created treatments for other disease, typhoid fever, tetanus, meningitis. And the goal was explicitly to make medicine available for all. In other words, completely different than the private pharmaceutical industry. And for the next seven decades, Connaught Labs was this incredible Canadian success story. Uh, it produced affordable medications for deadly diseases. Uh, it saved countless lives in that way. Um, you know, and unlike private pharmaceutical companies, the scientists at Connaught Labs, they did research based on what was needed not on what was profitable because they were publicly owned. They didn't care about profits. Um, so as a result, because they were focused on what was needed, they did some incredible, uh, incredible medical research. In fact, they contributed to some of the key medical breakthroughs of the 20th century, uh, insulin, penicillin, the polio vaccine. Um, and they also played an essential role in the global eradication of smallpox. Uh, and yet, you know, even, even despite these just stunning achievements, uh, unbelievably, the Mulroney government privatized Connaught Labs in the late 1980s. And, uh, you know, it just makes you wonder what, you know, what, what we could, where we would be today. One minute, Linda. One minute. Oh, I thought I was getting a five-minute warning. Well, you got another two minutes. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll try it. Yeah. Okay. Just the tragedy that um, you know we there we have this vaccine leader. Imagine where we could have been um, in the you know in the nineteen fifties. We contributed. Not develop the help develop the polio vaccine, the smallpox they contributed to the eradication. It's just astonishing. Imagine if now we could turn to Connaught for help uh, in developing the COVID vaccine. We would have been at the forefront of that COVID vaccine development. Um, uh, and also, we would have been at the for, forefront of the production capacity for COVID. Uh, but, you know, None of that is happening. Today, Connaught, instead of being owned by the people of Canada and putting health before profit and ensuring Canadians get vaccines when we need them uh, and contributing to the advance of global medicine, today Connaught doesn't do any of those things because it's a mere subsidiary of a big pharmaceutical giant. And I, I think that's an incredible tragedy. Um, so maybe I'll just cut to the end kind of quickly Just well wait. yes okay but if you can do it in one minute please oh yeah no no I, I, in fact i'm just gonna i'm gonna close with a plea for a wealth tax which may seem a bit off topic but uh, uh i i think most people would agree with the insane amount of inequality 
uh, well taxable as they needed, and uh, two thirds of Canadians, in fact, support a wealth tax. In fact, the case is so obvious, I'm not even going to try and make it, but for a wealth tax. So, but I want to conclude by quoting uh, the late US multi billionaire David Koch explaining how he became so rich, because I think this helps us understand um, how people become rich. He said, when I was a little boy, my father gave me an apple. I sold it for $5 and bought two more apples and sold them for $10. Then with that money, I bought four more apples and sold them for $20. I continued to do this day after day, year after year, until one day my father died and left me $300 million. Okay. Anyway, thanks very much. <laughs> That's great. Thank, you. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Our next speaker is John Orrick, the president of the Federal NDP Association in Thornhill. John is also a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus, a retired fireman, and a member of Socialist Action. Welcome, John. Greetings, everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Canada needs a publicly owned pharmaceutical company that produces drugs in Canada and distributes them under a Pharmacare Act. The present situation of gigantic, privately held pharmaceutical companies is broken, dangerous, and contributes to gross inequality worldwide. The world's largest pharmaceutical company is Johnson & Johnson and had revenues of $81 billion in 2018. This is larger than the GDP of Ghana or Panama. Rock Pharmaceuticals has a revenue of $54 billion. Pfizer, $52 billion. Novartis, $51 million. Sanofi Pasteur, the world's largest producer of vaccines with a plant here in Toronto, has $40 billion in annual revenue. How did pharma, big pharma get so big? Well, the main reason is through retained earnings, capital, and capital accumulation through profits. The profits in drug production are amongst the highest of any industrial sector in the world, commonly 15%. But another way big pharma has grown is through acquisitions and the monopolization and streamlining of markets. Some of these mergers are synonymous with their name, as in AstraZeneca. GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi Pasteur. If Pfizer listed all the acquisitions, its name would be a paragraph long. So this is a common story, is that a small pharmaceutical company creates a, a drug, it's, it's profitable, they create a patent, and then a large, huge multinational buys them out. In fact, patents are the backbone of profits in big pharma. A patent is a form of intellectual property that gives its owner the legal right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention for a limited period in exchange for publishing and enabling disclosure of the invention. Pre crude precursors to patents were in ancient Greece. The oldest patent was the Venetian patent statue of 1474 in an era when capitalism was emerging out of feudalism. In England, there was a patent, uh, James Watt had a patent uh, for the steam engine in England in 1769. In England, patents were issued by the Crown in return for royalties. The first American patent was signed by George Washington in 1790 by, uh, for Samuel Hopkins and a new method for manufacturing potash. But however, patents are like fiat money, government bonds, stocks or corporate law itself. They're not naturally appearing phenomenon. They're thought up, legislated and administered and enforced by sovereign nations. The World Trade Org, okay, the, and after that they're extended beyond the nation state to into the international sphere by agreements freely entered into by nation states. The World Trade Organization adjudicates drug and patent concerns through the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, commonly known as TRIPS. In Canada, drug patent rights are further extended by the Canadian-Europe Trade Agreement and by the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. 
And despite efforts by labor and progressive organization to, to have cheaper generic drugs, these trade agreements have actually extended patent rights for some drugs from eight to 10 years. Big Pharma spends as much on marketing and advertising as they do in research and development. Watch TV. The other day I watched three drug ads in a row. They push drugs onto an easily beguiled public. They encourage oversubscription of drugs and they try to subvert and bury peer reviewed studies critical of them. Some practice flagrant price gouging. These are not unsubstantiated claims. In 2009, Pfizer paid a 2.3 settlement for kickbacks for prescriptions and submitting false claims to insurers. In 2011, Merck and Company fined $950 million for unlawful, unlawfully promoting Vioxx and causing thousands of heart attacks. Johnson & Johnson paid a $2 billion in off-label marketing of Risperdal, Invega, and Natrasor. Martin Shkreli, CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals, still languages in jail for stock fraud. In 2015, his company raised the price of Daripram from $13 to $750 a pill. We have an opioid crisis in North America. Several drug companies have agreed to billion-dollar settlements for their role in falsifying the effects and overscribing Oxycontin and other opioids. In 2020 in BC, the deaths from opioid overdoses almost doubled to 1,700. So what about big pharma and the COVID response? Farm, big pharmaceutical companies are being hugely subsidized by governments and taxpayers. The warp speed distribution of $10 billion in, US, in the US to help vaccine rollouts is the largest in the world, but others are following suit. Much of this money will still go out in dividends to rich stockholders who have nothing to do with the research and development of the drugs, proving that we're not all in this together. Psychophantic journalists hail the rollout of COVID vaccines as being miraculous, but this is totally false. The science behind viral vector vaccines has been well established. Laboratories were able to shift their efforts toward a COVID vaccine and develop the antigens and adjutants to use in manufacturing a vaccine. Even the newer mRNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna had a fundamental scientific basis before the pandemic. This was not a miracle. This was the work of dedicated teams of scientists and lab technicians using the most advanced microbiology and instruments available. The proof of this is in the relatively concurrent rollout of vaccines from all over the world, from China to Russia to England and to the United States. Also remember this so-called miracle must be tempered with the fact that the usual stage three trials are not completed and the US FDA has them on emergency approval. This has taken several months off the whole process. Big Pharma has not in sharing their patented knowledge and techniques. And this is a break on scientific development. They have not allowed cheaper generic drugs production by temporarily suspending the TRIPS agreement. So third world countries can produce cheaper drugs. AstraZeneca has only licensed the Serum Institute of India to produce their vaccine for a royalty. The only agreement that the big nine pharma companies were able to make was not to cheat on testing procedures for the vaccines. The fact of the matter is big pharma was ill-prepared for this COVID breakout. We have been warned for years about the possibility of zoonotic transmissions of disease by tearing down wildlife habitat and big farming. So this is not a miracle. Before uh, moving to Canada in our response, I want to make one point, that is, and that is that uh, stock equity companies are not required to create the vaccine. In three different countries, public companies, have, uh, public industries have created a vaccine. Sinopharm in China is still a state-run company. In Russia, the Sputnik V vaccine is, was created by the Gemalaya Institute, was still administered by the Ministry of Health, in Russia, and little Cuba has created a, the Soberana drug with 
dilapidated equipment and a dearth of equipment, and they've still been able to do to create a drug that's only two months behind the rest of the world. So I'll just turn quick and conclude with Canada. Canada's response to COVID and vaccine distribution has been deplorable. We are the mendicants of the third of the first world. We are begging for vaccines. We are the bottom laggards in the rollout of, of vaccination. We even considered dipping into the COVAX supply of vaccines, was, which was earmarked to, to the third world. I don't know if we did get any or not, but even the thought, the thought of it is ridiculous. We vote with the rich nations of the world to disallow generic production of cheap vaccines. And all this, all of this stems from our lack of domestic production, because as Linda pointed out, cannot last. 30 seconds, John has been sold out and they're just not up to snuff here in the plant here. They're not producing the vaccine and they're not getting any help from any other co companies who would share the vaccine because we could produce if there were no such thing as patents. So what we need is a publicly owned pharmaceutical company in Canada and a pharmacare uh, a plan to distribute them freely to people who need them. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Sears. She's a leading member of Socialist Action Canada based in Guelph, Ontario. She helped to organize a union for teaching assistance at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo and now sings in the community and works as a music teacher. Welcome, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to John and Linda who have just finished speaking. That was excellent. And I just want to say that as a young person who didn't know about the history of Connaught Labs, I found that particular chapter in the book to really genuinely devastating to read. My medication costs me over $150 a month. And watching the House of Commons last month defeat Peter Julian's Pharmacare Bill um, C213 felt like a genuine slap in the face to me and to so many others who are desperately trying to balance out the cost of medication on top of our already egregious cost of living and low salaries. So I recently graduated with an MA from Wilfrid Laurier University uh, in a not insignificant amount of debt stemming from many years uh, lacking oversight and lacking funding around universities and their subsequent tuition increases. Granted, the situation, I'll admit, is not yet so severe as it is in the United States, where tuition costs have soared to, frankly, criminal levels, but uh, being better than the United States isn't much of a favorable argument. As Linda argues in chapter two of her book, uh, universities and public education uh, have been under constant attack since the 1970s in the wake of powerful student radical movements um, and also the rise of neoliberal economic thinking. The idea that universities in particular should not be run as public institutions for the improvement of human knowledge and experiences, but rather as industries where education is a product marketed to consumers has deeply, deeply taken root in administrative thinking. Universities are now tailored wherein, as I say, the education that students receive is a product to be marketed and competed for by students who can afford it, which creates massively increasing social stratification on university campuses. The devastating effects of this ideology are immediately visible to anyone who spends any time in academia or wants to listen to an academic rant about it, which I shall do now. So every academic currently working is very keenly aware of the increasingly precarious working conditions that they experience, uh, often referred to as the proletarianization of intellectual labor. Once secure tenured and tenure track positions are now being offered as part time or contract positions that need to be reapplied for every year. The precarity of work creates a tremendous amount of stress for the faculty, as well as very much decreased learning outcomes for the students. However, it certainly leads to increased profit for the university administrations and their corporate funders. A part-time contract faculty friend of mine recently disclosed that she is paid a lump sum of $6,000 total 
per course not include and this does not include any kind of benefits or insurance um, let alone sick days uh, while the tenured faculty with the same administrative and teaching schedules at the university I went to for my undergrad are making well over $120,000 up to $150,000 per year. Furthermore, academics in this very precarious position can be caught up in the cycle of publish or perish. Renewal of contracts can be entirely dependent on a certain number of publications per year. Now, you can watch some of our other webcasts where we've discussed the perils of this incredibly short-sighted ideology and policy. Um, our comrade uh, and leading member, Daniel Terade, has written a wonderful pamphlet about the importance of needing to nationalize scientific publishing, um, which John also mentioned. But suffice to say, the policy of requiring academics to publish multiple papers a year um, with less and less oversight and less and less quality peer review. Um, it treats academic labor like industrial manufacturing. This concern over quality or quantity over quality and novelty over utility culminates in less access to knowledge for the public and benefits fewer of us overall. I also want to talk about things from not only the faculty and workers' perspective, but also the student perspective. So today's student activism is alive and well as young people, well, we examine our futures and find it frighteningly unsatisfying. Nonetheless, the institutions we attend are often deeply invested in the industries that are sacrificing our future for profit. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the divest movement, which demands that universities pull their investments from major oil and gas and other polluting industries. While this gesture of divestment is largely symbolic, it does uh, reinforce the confrontation and the dissonance uh, inherent in for-profit educational systems that willingly sacrifice their students' long-term well-being. This past year, I also had the opportunity to take part in a campaign to unionize the Laurier teaching assistants, and this was part of a multi-year effort to bring TAs into the same standard um, that other academic student labor in Ontario experiences. Unionized TAs across the province make vastly more per hour than non-unionized workers. The average salary for TAs in Toronto is around um, $40 an hour, whereas for non-unionized TAs, it varies widely. I've heard some TAs getting paid as low as $16 per hour. Our drive was successful, which was exciting. We were ratified this past year, and the union bug has apparently been spreading to the neighboring University of Waterloo, a school with deep ties to private multinational corporations like Google, Facebook, and many, many other engineering and technology companies. Um, there's a long history of universities exploiting all kinds of different student labor. I also want to take the opportunity to shout out um, the Mount Allison Student Union Group, um, who is ad, uh, the student workers group who is advocating for better wages and better training for residence assistants and teaching assistants on campus. Um, last I read, the Mount Allison residence assistants are the lowest paid residence assistants in all of North America. And we are hoping that the labor activism and more public consciousness of the needs of the workers is able to radically transform the quality of living, mental health of all of the employees, um, and change the standards for all of the workers um, across the campus. Overall, transformation will only be um, will only be reassured by a return to public ownership and the public institution of the university, rather than, as we say, this private and public partnership model that seems to be catching on. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. And now we're going to uh, go to our producer, technical producer in Mississauga to ask some questions that's been, he's going to put in the chat uh, from our online audience. And uh, my producers told me we have up to 12 questions, so that's wonderful. Uh, we're going to take four questions at a time. 
uh, that will be put in the chat and you will have each have up to five minutes to answer one, two, three, or four. And the lineup of speakers will be Emily, Linda, and John. So Kurt, over to you. Okay, so our first question comes from Barry Weisler. He asks, what steps should be taken to create a public pharmaceutical industry in Canada to meet the needs for anti-pandemic vaccines and medical drugs in the interest of good public health? Julius A. asks, Linda, can you tell us why you oppose Trudeau's purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline from Kinder Morgan? Daniel Terade asks, the University of Toronto cannot labs was privatized under Mulroney. Now University of Toronto joins one public-private partnership after another. How do students and workers push to keep public research in public hands? Thank you. And John Wanderlich asks, whether the resources or industries are private or public, isn't it the case that both serve the needs of capital in Canada? Things may be made public so as to provide a, stabil a stable utility. Okay, thank you, Kurt. So we're going to go now to our panelists. And remember, I'm going to keep you strictly within the five minute mark because we got a lot of questions and we try to get this done in an hour and a half. So um, Emily, you're up first. Uh, Emily seems to have been having problems, so I think we Okay, have to so Linda, you're up first. Unmute yourself, Linda, please. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see. What's a... Okay, well, let me just quickly, Barry's question, what's in the pharmaceutical industry? Well, okay, I totally agree with what John said very effectively about how we need a, a national publicly owned pharmaceutical company. They're not along the lines of Connaught Labs, if not, in fact, Connaught Labs, uh, as well as a pharmaceutical, uh, you know, drug program. But let me just quickly um, say uh, on the nationalization because i think there's a very strong argument for actually nationalizing not labs that has now been privatized and is now owned by sanofi uh, you know it's interesting there was a very stupid article in the national post arguing that oh you know now that we have sanofi everybody you know there's nothing wrong with mulroney privatizing now it's this wonderful company, Sanofi. Well, th this is a perfect illustration of why the privatization has been so serious. What happens at Sanofi, the Connaught Labs, now owned by Sanofi, is controlled by the headquarters of Sanofi in France. And so, for instance, Sanofi is producing a COVID vaccine they're working on a COVID vaccine and they have, they're expecting to be able to produce it by the end of this year. But uh, they, they are producing it at their plants in the US and in Europe. And they have no plans to produce it at their Canadian plant, which was Connaught. So in fact, as Trudeau explained when he was asked about this, you know, why can't we get the old uh, Connaught labs to produce it? a vaccine for Canada. He said, well, they're producing, Sanofi's producing it down in the US and in Europe. And so we'll have to wait because we're not at the front of the line. Uh, you know, the company, the country where it's produced gets the first dibs on things. Well, so it's no val, it's ridiculous to say it's the same thing to have Connaught Labs run by Sanofi that we have no control over whatsoever what they produce there or anything and the wonderful company we had before, Connaught. So I just wanted to quickly say that. Um, okay, there's a question about uh, oh, uh, Trans Mountain. I think there was a question about Trans Mountain. Um, yeah, geez, uh, the number, the reasons I'm against the Trans Mountain pipeline uh, by the Trudeau government, uh, you know, let me count the ways. There's so many reasons to be against it. But basically uh, what happened was that Trans Mountain Pipeline, of course, should not be produced because we have to be moving off fossil fuels. 
So it's just completely nonsensical if we have any interest in fighting climate change to be uh, purchasing this pipeline and, and expanding it. Basically what was happening was trend was owned by Kinder Morgan and it was, uh, Kinder Morgan was having all kinds of problems getting approvals for it through the, uh, you know, First Nations were extremely resistant, a lot of them, um, and environmental concerns. So it was having a lot of delays. And also the market for, for um, uh, you know, for oil ha has gone down, uh, you know, and, and so... It, it's counterproductive, even from an economic point of view, uh, to be developing a long-term strategy for developing oil sands oil, which is extremely expensive to produce and not going to be competitive against cheaper. I, I, I don't know. Is my time up? I... No, two minutes. Oh, oh okay. Um, so, 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 so. Anyway, it was having. Kinder Morgan was having all kinds of problems. And so it kind of wanted to get out of this deal. It, it was no longer interested in developing the pipeline. And by the way, what the pipeline, what we're talking about here is the pipeline already exists. What they want to do is double or triple the capacity of that pipeline. Uh, and, and, and so that would be extremely terrible for the environment, for climate change. The last thing we want is more uh, more dirty oil getting out uh, through that pipeline. Uh, but anyway, so, so Kinder Morgan was in tremendous difficulty and the Trudeau government came along and purchased Kinder Morgan so that Canadian taxpayers uh, would be owning it and would be paying to develop it. This to me, is exactly what we don't want governments to be doing. We want governments to be owning useful things that will benefit Canadians. We don't want them to be owning a pipeline that will hurt the world, hurt Canadians, makes no economic sense. But this is what the Trudeau government did in order to please the oil industry and please Alberta and, and, and please the investment community. This is a, just a terrible, terrible decision. It's going to cost about $12 billion is the, is the amount that's been allocated for that. Uh, it, it, you know, it just, it's just outrageous when we have so many needs. If they took that $12 billion, you could produce Connaught Labs 20 times over and think of how much more useful that would be for Canadians. This just has to become... A political issue and the NDP is the only party that's likely to raise it so they should they must thank you Linda Emily you have up to five minutes to answer uh, one or all questions up to you five yeah. minutes I'll take the last two questions because Linda effectively answered the first two um, so Daniel asked about uh, the privatization of Connaught Labs and the University of Toronto is joining one public private partnership after the owner, after the other. Um, how do students and workers push back to keep public research in public hands? So um, YouTube, don't delete us for this, but I think the answer might be slightly illegal. And by illegal, I mean the work that is being done over at Sci-Hub. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sci-Hub is a illegal, um, kind of in the fuzzy gray area uh, of publishing. And basically it's an online website where scientific publishing articles uh, are available for free. Um, it is operated out of, I believe, Kazakhstan. It is run by uh, a woman there. And I think it's brilliant. And there's a lot of really, really intense debate happening right now over the morality versus legality of Sci-Hub. But I think, I think there's going to need to be a real pushback against the laws that govern these you know, public-private investments and the knowledge that is generated from them being like you know hey the knowledge was generated with public funding by public servants we have a right to access that um so reinforcing that by you know 
these moral contradictions like what Sci-Hub presents and, you know, making things available in the Creative Commons, um, which, you know, is expensive in its own way and is fraught with its own issues. But I believe, I think we need to push back against the profitable industries by going to the source and cutting them off from things that make them profitable. Um, John Wunderlich asked um, whether resources in the industries are private or public, isn't it the case that they both serve the needs of capital? Um, I mean, well, yes, but also no. I mean, in private industry, obviously, the emphasis is on, you know, capital accumulation, on making a profit, um, whereas public utilities tend to be more concerned with A, staying afloat, and B, you know, generating the resources that are required. Um, however, I think we can all pretty much agree that the only real path forward um, is worker control of the industries. Um, workers controlling the need, workers controlling the industries that they provide for, that they understand intimately, that they know the needs of, and they know the needs of their communities. That is how um, we provide and maintain a stable utility. Thank you, Emily. Okay, John, you have five minutes. Okay, I'm going to take a few minutes uh, for a sales pitch. Um, Linda's written many books. They include uh, Shooting the Hippo, Death by Deficit, The Trouble with Billionaires with Neil Brooks, and most recently, The Sport and Prey of Capitalists, which is now shooting its way up the bestsellers list. It is a must read if you're interested in political economic history, and you can order it right here and now. You can get an autographed copy dedicated to yourself for $20 by just emailing me at j-o-r-r-e-t-t -T at rogers.com. You'll get an autographed book by Linda McQuay. You can't pass this deal up. So contact me, and from there, I will handle uh, the payment and delivery details. I'll handle it from there. So don't miss this opportunity. Okay, so if you want to put that on chat, Kurt, uh, my email address, that'd be great. Uh, so, okay, to, I'm going to answer Mary's first question as quickly as I can. Uh, how do you recreate recreate Connaught Labs? Because I think we should call it Connaught Labs. We have publicly owned pharmaceutical company. First, we passed Bill 213, which is the PharmaCare Act that the NDP tried to pass. Let's get free drugs as part of uh, the Canada Health Act, number one. Then at the April NDP convention, we need to pass a resolution by the NDP saying that we the NDP is going to support this. The NDP isn't going to support it. It's not going anywhere. So we get the NDP to support it. Then, of course, we need to form a government. And then when we form the government, we create the Crown Corporation. We get all the university and hospital laboratories and assets and create uh, Connaught, uh, Connaught Labs. But then we also go after not just Sanofi. I've got, I would have my eyes set on Apotex as well. Apotex is the largest generic distributor of drugs in Canada with $4 billion in revenues. We have negotiations with Sanofi and, uh, and uh, Apotex, but we put the heat on. We make it known to them that they will have trouble selling any drugs at all in Canada if they don't sell. You put the heat on them to get a decent price. Because usually whenever we sell public assets, we sell them too cheaply. And ever when we ever try to buy them back, we pay too much. That can't happen again. So we take them over. This Barry's taught me this with long-term low interest bonds we take that's how we take them over we don't just national total a little bit of peace we'll give you some money for it but we need to take over those two as the basis for the company so that's what i think we should do uh john wonderlich's question i thought was very good uh it's uh yeah you don't just because you nationalize something doesn't really make it a workers corporation and there's many uh things uh we have to do as well. And I think um, Emily hit the nail on the head when she said, you know, we have to have workers control and not just workers control, community control, the industries in the community, how does that affect them as well? So worker community control, 
Um, and sometimes, yes, large uh, nationalized corporations have act somewhat like uh, private companies, like Petro Canada. Could you really tell the difference between Petro Canada and Shell or Esso? The price was the same, service was similar. But on the other hand, Petro Canada at least was making profits, lots of money, and that money did at any time could go back into the public purse. That's the big key. It does go back into the public. 30 seconds. So, uh, and Hydro Ontario is another one. Yeah, Hydro Ontario needed to be under worker control and they shouldn't have been uh, into uh, nuclear power. So, yes, there's a problem. It doesn't solve everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, so we're going to go back to Kurt now for four more questions. Kurt? One moment. Okay. Uh, Spencer uh, Roki asks, school teachers are subtly discouraged for teaching socialism and the importance of unionization due to lack of any mandatory curriculum standards that emphasize teaching anything that would directly empower working class students. Unions generally show no interest in reforming the curriculum to change this and are often hostile to those who do push for socialist education. Are there any strategies that leftist educators can take to change attitudes in the unions to push the ministry to include a leftist perspective in the curriculum? Um, Dinner with Franklin asks, does the CIB provide low interest investment to any municipalities at all, or do they exclusively transfer public money to private industry? Yuri Muckraker asks, does uh, Ms. McQuaig support in response to the coronavirus and beyond that we need a UBI. And uh, Barry Weisleder asked, Justin Trudeau's Canada Infrastructure Bank shows how his agenda is totally uh, uh, tied to subsidizing profits or capital at the cost of working people. What should be done about the CIB? Okay, so you've read and heard the questions. So the lineup will be John, Linda and then Emily and you each have up to five minutes five strict minutes so please watch your time in the chat thank you John you're still muted John well okay that I you barely have time to write them down but Barry's questions about the uh they're in the chat John you don't have to write them down the okay, questions no, are in the uh, chat. You don't have to write them down. I don't want to look over there anyways. It'll take me too long. I'm half blind. So I'm going to, I, do, I get the gist of his questions. Uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, just don't do it. That's all. Don't do it. Build a postal bank instead. Have a, have a, have a publicly owned uh, retail commercial bank that competes with the other banks and uh, works on behalf of the Canadian people. We need a publicly owned bank. Maybe out of the po a postal bank would be a good start, but I think they can go more places than just post office. They can be in uh, airports and all over, just like any other retail bank. We need publicly owned banks. So I just, I wouldn't follow the, uh, that the, the CIB at all. It's just a total, a total ripoff as uh Linda has written about in many of her articles. Um, Gar did somebody ask about guaranteed universal basic income? I think Gary did. Uh, that can be somewhat of a trap. I would be hesitant if the workers' movement and others wanted a guaranteed universal basic income. I'd be hesitant to uh, vote or lobby against it, but we have to be careful that... This doesn't become just here. We'll give you a bunch of money per month, but we have, we're going to charge you for services. You're, there's going to be, we're going to cut back on education and health and social security and everything else. And you're going to have to pay the private sector to do that. So universal basic income has to be coupled with a, a fight to not only keep our social service net, but to actually improve it. So uh, that's what I'd say on that. Uh, the, the question on uh, schools and teachers, I'm going to leave that to Emily. I, I'm, uh, but I would hope that, that unions and uh, other groups would empower uh, the Ministry of Education to teach us about uh, socialism and, uh, and public works and everything like that. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Linda. Five minutes. 
Okay. Um, yeah, well, let me start with that question about the infrastructure bank. Let me see. Dinner with Franklin. Uh, does the CIB uh, provide low interest investment? Yeah. The, okay. This, no, this is very, this is exactly my point. The Canada Infrastructure Bank, uh, suppose, I mean, just try and get your head around this. $35 billion of public money, if the money only goes to the private partner in the, the private public partnership, okay? The municipality gets nothing. That, that's the reason, that's why I told that story about Mapleton. That illustrates the, the, the Canada Infrastructure Bank was extremely excited about that Mapleton deal it was offering. It promoted it in its materials, sort of saying this is a pilot project for other water projects we're going to do across the country. Uh, and the minute that, that Mapleton decided they didn't want the deal because it was going to be too expensive for them, this, the Canada Infrastructure Bank just drops them, offers them nothing. Like the money, the, the uh, $20 million subsidy package was only going to be for that private partner, not for the municipality. This is just outrageous. Um, and and the, the reason that they're offering it like, the reason they're doing it like that is that it takes a, a private partner uh, you know, is more expensive than, like, if you do a, a P3 deal as opposed to developing the infrastructure yourself as a municipality, it's more expensive because the private partner expects a profit of between 7 and 9%, and that's built into the deal. Well, that's more expensive. But so the Canned Infrastructure Bank is effectively sort of guaranteeing the private partner, this seven to nine percent, it couldn't be more crazy. More it has nothing to do with the public system. Okay, um, UBI. Actually, I think John answered that question very well. I have the exact same feelings about it. Uh, it, it worries me that you know it'll be used as an argument to you know you get a little bit of money per month and then there'll be nothing. Uh, everything else will be called it. Um, so, so, but, but like John, uh, I remember I went to a public meeting once about the UBI, and I went sort of very skeptical. And I must say, the passion of the people that were living in poverty, describing what this would mean to them, uh, was very powerful. So, I, I don't feel, you know, I feel it's a complex question. I don't really know what my feeling is on it, but I want to hear what people in poverty feel about it. Um, final, do I have a chance to, the, the question I think Barry was asking, what should be done about the mandate of the Canada yes. Infrastructure Bank? Uh, yes, you have two minutes. We must change the mandate. If you look at the website describing what this bank is all about, it talks about how it's an it's innovative new financing method and bringing in the private sector, all things that we don't really care about. We don't care about an innovative financing method that's just going to enrich the, the rich. We care about getting good, valuable infrastructure built at a good cost. And there is no, nothing about that. We, we, the mandate of the Canada Infrastructure Bank has got to be changed. It's got to be more like the mandate of that bank I mentioned in Holland, that public bank. Well, that was just about water, but they have public banks for all kinds of things in Europe. And basically, they have a public mandate. They have to serve the public interest. And and that would include, you know, that's got to be that uh, it's a benefit to the public, not to the private sector. Thank you, Linda. Emily, five minutes. All right. So um, I'll do my best uh, to answer these questions. So regarding school teachers, I'll disclose I am I'm not a school teacher. I am a private music teacher, um, but aiming to get into more public education uh, in the near future. 
Um, I, feel, I feel like, honestly, Barry might be a good person to ask about this, um, given that he did this a lot in his tenure as a teacher. Um, I would say that I, I don't know if it's necessarily accurate to say that the unions have no interest in reforming the curriculum. I think it's more that curriculum reforms tend to be difficult processes and they are often initiated by governments themselves. I mean, we saw this recently with uh, Doug Ford um, wanting to overhaul the math curriculum and um, situations in Alberta um, where the curriculum is actually um, mandated by the government in power um, and less so by the unions. Now, could the unions push back more on um, curriculum mandates by the government and put forth their own demands? Absolutely. Um, where And strategies that leftist educators can take to change the attitudes, I'm, yeah, as I say, I think, I, I mean, organization within the union is, is always something that we here at Socialist Action will encourage. And, you know, forming a chapter within the union of educators who want to push a particular curriculum or who want to modify the curriculum and make curriculum adjustments um, and pushing the unions to do that with partnership from other unions or other locals um, has a lot of power and a lot of potential. Uh, possibly not under a Doug Ford government. We've seen how incredibly hostile these conservatives are and with Minister Stephen Lecce towards teachers, uh, horrifically so in a lot of ways. Um, I don't see a lot of change happening under Ford, but we can hope for, for change in the future. And, you know, there's always covert days of just like, hey, you know, let's take 15 minutes at the end of the day to talk about this, kids. Uh, I also want to say that I think a really, a really big push um, for the kind of pro-union camp, a, a lot of kids learn about the power of a union by watching teacher strikes. Um, and a lot of the messaging around that. Um, I know that there were a lot of students who were largely in support of the teacher strikes, um, even though, you know, it was a cost to them personally, um, you know, they were losing their um, extracurriculars and they were losing instructional days, losing all kinds of opportunities. They knew that, you know, long-term, you know, their music classes might disappear entirely with budget cuts and and all kinds of other things. Um, so they they knew what the risks were because the teachers were able to say like, hey, here's why we're striking, here's what we're doing, here's how this works. Um, and same thing has happened on university campuses and that's a lot of young people's first exposure to the power of a union. Um, and I think we can be really, really careful and really, really deliberate with the messaging that we give kids and we give young people around these kinds of labor movements and labor actions. Um, I won't touch on the CIB because uh, Linda did that brilliantly and I'm sure John will have lots to say. Um, and I, I do want to- 30 seconds. I do want to concur with John as well about um, UBI. I've heard lots of brilliant testimonials from people and the UBI pilot project uh, that was happening here in Ontario had really, really, really promising results. Um, you know, better financial stability, better emotional and mental health and physical stability for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, UBI would be vastly better than, you know, the current disability supports payments uh, that people receive, which are pitifully low. Um, Wrap up, Emily, so, please. Um, but as, as I say, like with UBI, there does need to be protections to stop landlords from going, oh, you've got a $2,000 a month UBI? What a coincidence. Your rent has just gone up by $1,000 a month. Um, and, you know, just that kind of blatant taking advantage of um, an increased amount of money in working class people's hands. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to our producer again for the four last questions. So please try your best to read them in the chat because it makes it easier. They're up there as we speak. And you only have four minutes this time. We've used up our time, so you only have four minutes each. And you can maybe pick and choose your questions. So go ahead, Kurt. And no, the lineup will be Linda, John, and Emily. And you each have four minutes. Okay, so my first question comes from Justine Allen. Why didn't the Ontario Liberals reverse the privatization of LTC homes, the long-term care centers, 
uh, or the lib federal liberals reverse the sale of the Connaught Labs. Julius A. asks, should progressives be championing the public ownership of the 407 and all privatized highways, most of which run through Tory-held writings? Why does the NDP not champion such issue? Doesn't the NDP stand to benefit? John Wunderlich asks, what about a maximum wage? And Barry Wiseletter asks, given how most corporations operate in relation to workers and the environment when privatized firms are nationalized, should the owners be compensated or fined for exploitation and abuse? Okay, Linda, four minutes. Unmute yourself there. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. So, uh, first uh, two questions. Uh, yeah, why didn't the Ontario Liberals reverse the... Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting because the Liberals always talk a better line than the Conservatives on the privatization issue. Uh, but they're really not any better on privatization. I, I, I'm not saying the I'm not using the argument liberals and conservatives are equally bad. I think the conservatives are definitely worse than the liberals uh, in many areas. But I will say, when it comes to privatization, when it comes to uh, you know propping up the private sector, the liberals are just as bad as the conservatives. Um, I mean, in this case, it was the the conservatives that privatized the LTC homes, but I'm not, it, would, it didn't surprise me at all that that wasn't reversed. And same with the thing about why didn't federal liberals reverse the sale of Connaught Labs? Like, there's no question, a lot of people in the debate now are sort of saying, why, you know, why attack the Mulroney government? The liberals could have brought, you know, brought back a public company. Absolutely true. At the same time, I would point out it's a lot easy, easier to hold on to a developed Connaught Labs than to, you know, try and nationalize one that exists. So, uh, but but the basic point is the Liberals are completely pro-private sector, uh, even though they're slightly progressive in other areas. Uh, should progressives be championing the public ownership of the 407? Uh, absolutely. Um, and all privatized highways, like, my attitude, I mean, I tell the whole story in the book, and I won't obviously get into it now, about the privatization of 407. It's just a total debacle. I mean, that was so crazy. As John pointed out, they always sell private or public assets for too little and buy uh, private assets for too much. They sold that uh, 407 for almost nothing, even though it was worth an absolute fortune, as we can see now. Uh, it and, and they signed a contract that lasts 99 years. Uh, so the amount of money that's going to be directed from the pockets of ordinary people in you know into uh, the coffers of the private companies involved in this. Now there is now a pension company involved, but uh, but but the point is that is not the way to finance our infrastructure. That sh it, it was originally set up as a uh, Bob Ray created the 407, uh, and it it, it 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 had a a, a toll on it right from the beginning, but it was. The commitment was as soon as the road was paid for, the toll would be lifted. And, and that, you know, but then uh, Harris took it over and privatized it with no commitment to ever lift that toll and no control over how high the toll could go. So, in fact, it's like a, a, a you know, they just got a huge money, money uh, cow, no, that's uh, seconds. Uh, and and it's it's outrageous, and we will not be able to properly control the development in the Toronto area without getting control. I would totally argue for the public ownership, the renationalization of the 407. Thank you, Linda. John, four minutes. Uh, why didn't Liberals reverse LTC or cannot? Well. 
because they're funded by big business. They're not as, I agree with Linda, they're not as bad and as obvious as the Conservatives, but they're a big business uh, party. Uh, for example, the Liberals in Ontario uh, got rid of the, the power, uh, Ontario Hydro, they, they sold off some of the generating. It was the Liberals who sold it off. Harris broke it all up into pieces, getting it ready to be sold, but uh, they took advantage of it and they sold it. That was the Liberals who sold it. Uh, the same thing with Petro Canada. That was Mr. Jean Chrétien who started the privatization in 10% tranches of Petro Canada. Harper, oh sure, Harper continued with it, but Jean Chrétien started it. So, yeah, the, they're the same, but slightly different in far uh, how far the Conservatives will go. The, the Liberals will try to capture the mushy middle. The liberal liars. Uh, Julius question on the 407. It runs right through my riding. So uh, it, it was the next highway that had to be logically built in in the GTA. It should be should have been like every other highway. Uh, Linda's book uh, points out how much it was sold by. And a little bit after the book came out, uh, the Quebec the company sold their 10% share. And it was almost exactly how much the Ontario government got for it about 10 percent that's what uh, that company I forget Lavalin SCNC Lavalin bought sold their 10 percent share for how much the the government got for it uh, John Wonderlich's question about the maximum wage yes sure I, I, I'd agree but we're going to have a maximum wage good debate on what how high it is but there's another way of doing that too and that's having an income tax rate of 90 80 90 percent of the very highest wages and when they had that uh you know in the 50s the inequality between the ceo and the workers was much lower i mean why would you go for a huge pay increase when you're going to be giving 80 90 percent of it back to the government so yeah i'm going for a i'd go for a maximum wage but a, a, a huge uh 90 percent uh, tax rate on the on the highest highest incomes would work too uh what was the last one uh 30 oh, seconds uh, Barry, about uh, how to how to nationalize. I get, the situation really would dictate, but you know, I would use every dirty trick in the socialist book to try to undermine whatever we pay or whatever we get out. They've benefited enough, and uh, I'd try to compensate them for the uh, uh, the lowest amount possible. That's all. Thank you, John. Four minutes, Emily. All right, I know we're running up against 8.30, so I'll keep it quick. Um, yeah, I mean, why didn't the Ontario Liberals reverse privatization? Because they're pro-privatization. We've, we've addressed this. They, they benefit just as much uh, as the Conservatives do, and we all suffer the same. Um, now, championing the public ownership of the 407. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, I mean, Linda identifies in the book that the McGuinty... Um, government tried to fight back against the privatization and discovered, mm, great, Mike Harris has made the contract with the 99-year the contract of the privatization of the 407 a really ironclad contract in favor of the private company. And so it turns out that it is ludicrously expensive in legal fees and also very, 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 very difficult contractually to get out of this. And so even if it were, even if there were public interest and political will to do this, turns out it's it's harder even than that. Um, and so just because of how much the McGinty liberals struggled with that, there's kind of been a like, oh, well, crap, you know, that that's annoying. Uh, and that seems to be kind of the attitude. Um, now, uh, other things that have less rigid contracts, yes, I think that's where we should start, kind of cut our teeth, if you will. Um, and why does the NDP not champion such issues? I think because they know it's really freaking difficult. It's really, really hard to do. Um, as we said, like, you know, it's very, very easy to sell public corporations at an absolute pittance and very, very difficult to get them back once they are sold. Private, The private sector does not like to let go of, of money horse. Like, we'll stop kicking this horse when it stops spitting out money. 
Um, and maximum wage, I mean, you know, I am, I am firmly anti-billionaire. You know, you get to how you get to a billion dollars and you're immediately hit with a hundred percent tax and congratulations, you won capitalism. You, you get a trophy. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, there needs to be a maximum wage, but more than anything, there needs to be a really, really aggressive tax on um, corporate profits and um, inherited wealth and um, wealth derived from investments, because those are not taxed nearly at the same rates. Uh, and there's very little uh, political in will to tax those because the wealthiest donors make all their money that way. Um, so there needs to be a renewed public interest in taxing, um, <coughs> taxing sources of income that most of us don't have any, most of us do not and will not ever have access to, um, or at least in much, much different ratios. Um, given how most corporations operate in relation to workers and the environment, uh, should the owners be compensated for... Uh, when the firms are nationalized or fined for exploitation and abuse. I mean, obviously, I'm going to come down on the fined end of things. 30 yes, seconds, I'm Emily. Up. Yep, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, but I think there needs to be a really strict um, public plan and legal plan um, to prevent um, corporations from creatively opting out of taking accountability um we've seen you know companies declaring financial or like bankruptcy or changing ownership to avoid any kind of accountability um and that needs to have a legal limit that says no there is absolutely no excuse there's no legal loophole you know you can declare bankruptcy all you want you are still on the hook for this and you know pay it out of your private coffers if you need to sucks to suck <laughs> thank you and thank you emily and special thanks to everybody especially to linda mcquake and and remember you can get an autographed copy of our book uh, for only twenty dollars uh the email address to do that is in the chat column kurt put it up there so also thanks to john and emily and of course kurt our uh, our producer and please consider being a supporter of Socialist Action Newspaper, which we will send to you online. To fill out the form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to socialistactioncanada at gmail.com or just give us a call, 647-986-1917. Once again, folks, if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next essay webcast will be on Thursday, March the 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on the topic, Why the Police Should Be Defunded, Disarmed, and Disbanded, with uh, Rajan uh, Hylet, a Prison uh, Abolishes and Community Organizer, and Loretta Fisher of Spring Magazine, and leading essay members, Kurt Young and Corey David. So that's next Thursday, March the 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In the meantime, please be happy, stay healthy, 